Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to TSMC's fourth quarter 2020 earnings conference call. This is Jeff Su, TSMC's Director of Investor Relations and your host for today. To prevent the spread of COVID-19, TSMC is hosting our earnings conference call via live audio webcast through the company's website at www.tsmc.com, where you can also download the earnings release materials. If you are joining us through the conference call, your dial-in lines are in listen-only mode. The format for today's event will be as follows. First, TSMC's Vice President and CFO, Mr. Wendell Huang, will summarize our operations in the fourth quarter 2020, followed by our guidance for the first quarter 2021. Afterwards, Mr. Huang and TSMC's CEO, Dr. C.C. Wei, will jointly provide the company's key messages. Then, TSMC's chairman, Dr. Mark Liu, will host a Q&A session where all three executives will entertain your questions. As usual, I would like to remind everybody that today's discussions may contain forward-looking statements that are subject to significant risks and uncertainties, which could cause actual results to differ materially from those contained in the forward-looking statements. Please refer to the safe harbor notice that appears in our press release. And now, I would like to turn the call over to TSMC CFO, Mr. Wendell Huang, for the summary of operations and the current quarter trends. Thank you, Jeff. Happy New Year, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. My presentation will start with financial highlights for the fourth quarter and a recap of full year 2020. After that, I will provide the guidance for the first quarter of 2021. Fourth quarter revenue increased 1.4% sequentially in NT terms, or 4.4% in US dollar terms, as we saw strong demand for our 5 nanometer technology, driven by 5G smartphone launches and HPC-related applications. Gross margin increased 0.6 percentage points sequentially to 54% mainly thanks to cost improvement, partially offset by the margin dilution from 5 nanometer RAM and an unfavorable exchange rate. Our utilization rate in the fourth quarter was at an extremely high level, partially due to more production output, of which some of the wafers will be shipped in the first quarter. Total operating expenses slightly decreased by 2.6 billion NT. Therefore, operating margins increased by 1.4 percentage points sequentially to 43.5%. Overall, our fourth quarter EPS was 5.51 NT, and ROE of 31.4%. Now let's move on to the revenue by technology. 5 nanometer process technology contributed 20% of wafer revenue in the fourth quarter, while 7 nanometer and 16 nanometer contributed 29% and 13% respectively. Advanced technologies, which are defined as 16 nanometer and below, accounted for 62% of wafer revenue. On a full year basis, 5 nanometer revenue contribution came in at 8% of 2020 wafer revenue. 7 nanometer was 33%, and 16 nanometer was 17%. Advanced technologies accounted for 58% of total wafer revenue, up from 50% in 2019. Now, moving on to the revenue contribution by platform. Smartphone increased 13% quarter over quarter to account for 51% of our fourth quarter revenue. HPC decreased 14% to account for 31%. IoT decreased 13% to account for 7%. Automotive increased 27% to account for 3%. Digital consumer electronics increased 29% to account for 4%. On a full year basis, smartphone, HPC, and IoT saw strong growth of 23%, 39%, and 28% respectively. DCE also increased 2%, while Alto decreased 7% in 2020. Overall, smartphone accounted for 48% of our 2020 revenue, HPC accounted for 33%, and 
and IoT accounted for 8%. Moving on to the balance sheet, we ended the fourth quarter with cash and marketable securities of 791 billion NT. On the liability side, current liabilities increased by 29 billion NT, mainly to, due to the increase of 57 billion in accounts payable and the increase of 30, 38 billion in accrued liabilities and others, offset by the decrease of 69 billion in short-term loan. Long-term interest-bearing debt increased by 28 billion NT, mainly as we raise 30.5 billion of corporate bonds during the quarter. On financial ratios, accounts receivable turnover days decreased one day to 39 days. Days of inventory increased 15 days to 73 days, primarily due to the ramp of leading rates. Now, let me make a few comments on cash flow and CapEx. During the fourth quarter, we generated about 259 billion NT in cash from operations, spent 89 billion in CapEx, and distributed 65 billion for first quarter 20 cash dividend. Short-term loans decreased by 67 billion, while bonds payable increased by 30.5 billion due to the bond issuances. Overall, our cash balance increased 50, 56 billion to 660 billion at the end of the quarter. In U.S. dollar terms, our fourth quarter capital expenditures totaled 3.2 billion dollars. Now let's look at the recap of our performance in 2020. We saw a strong growth in 2020 as our technology leadership position enabled us to capture the industry megatrends of 5G and HDC. Our revenue increased 31.4% in US dollar terms and 25.2% in NT dollar terms to reach 1.34 trillion NT. Gross margin increased 7.1 7.1 percentage points to 53.1%, primarily due to a high level of cap, cap, uh, capacity utilization and cost improvement. Operating margin increased 7.5 percentage point to 42.3%. Overall, full year EPS increased 50% to 19.97 NT. On cash flow, we spent 507 billion NT in CAPEX, while we generated 823 billion in operating cash flow and 315 billion in free cash flow. We also paid 259 billion NT in cash dividends in 2020. I have finished my financial summary. Now let's turn to our first quarter guidance. Based on the current business outlook, we expect our first quarter revenue to be between 12.7 billion and 13 billion US dollars, which represents a 1.3% sequential increase at the midpoint. Based on the exchange rate assumption of one US dollar to 27.95 NT, gross margin is expected to be between 50.5 and 52.5%. Operating margin between 39.5 and 41.5%. The sequential decline in first quarter gross margin is mainly due to a slightly lower utilization rate in the first quarter, albeit it is still staying at the high level, as well as an unfavorable foreign exchange rate. Now I would like to talk about the tax rate. We expect our 2020 tax rate to be in the range of 10 to 11 percent, and this will be equally applied to all four quarters of the year. This concludes my financial presentation. Okay. Now I would like to get, start with the uh, key messages for the quarter. I will start by making some comments on our capital budget in 2020 and 2021. Every year, our CAPEX is invested in anticipation of the growth that will follow in the next few years. Our capital investment decisions are based on four disciplines, 
technology leadership, flexible and responsive manufacturing, retaining customers' trust, and earning the proper return. In 2020, we spent 17.2 billion US dollars to capture the strong demand for our advanced technologies and support our customers' capacity needs. In order to meet the increasing demand for our advanced and specialty technologies and further support our customers' capacity needs, our 2021 capital budget is expected to be between 25 and 28 billion US dollars. Out of the 25 to 28 billion CAPEX for 2021, about 80% of the capital budget will be allocated for advanced process technologies, including 3 nanometer, 5 nanometer, and 7 nanometer. About 10% will be spent for advanced packaging and mask making, and about 10% will be spent for specialty technologies. Next, let me talk about our capital intensity outlook. As we have said previously, our long-term capital intensity is in the mid-30s percentage range. However, when we enter a period of higher growth, our CAPEX needs to be spent ahead of the revenue growth that will follow, so our capital intensity will be higher. For example, during 2010 to 2014, our CAPEX spending increased threefold as compared to the previous few years, and our capital intensity ranged between 38 to 50 percent. Because of the increased investment, we were able to capture the growth opportunities and deliver about 15 percent growth CAGR from 2010 to 2015. Today, as we enter another period of higher growth, we believe a higher level of capacity, a capital intensity is appropriate to capture the future growth opportunities. We now expect a higher growth CAGR in the next few years, driven by the industry megatrends of 5G and HPC related applications, which CC will discuss in more detail. We also expect this higher level of capital investment to continue to drive our technology leadership enable flexible and responsive manufacturing, and earn customers' trust. While our leading nose capital costs continue to increase due to increasing process complexities, it is expected to be compensated by continuing to sell our value, which includes the value of our technology, service, quality, and capacity support, and diligently working on cost improvement. With this level of CAPEX spending in 2021, we reiterate that TSMC remains committed to a sustainable cash dividends on both an annual and quarterly basis. Now let me turn the microphone over to CC. Thank you, Window. Hi, everyone. Uh, this is CC Wei. Good afternoon. We hope everybody is staying safe and healthy during this time. Now let me start with our near-term demand and inventory. We concluded our fourth quarter with revenue of NT 361.5 billion, or US dollar 12.7 billion, which was in line with our guidance, mainly due to strong demand for our 5 nanometer technology, driven by 5G smartphone launches and HPC-related applications. Concluding 2020, the semiconductor industry excluding memory growth was about 10%, while foundry industry increased about 20% year over year. TSMC's revenue grew 31.4% year over year in US dollar term. Moving into fourth quarter 2021, our business continues to be shrunk supported by HPC-related demand recovering in the automotive segment and a milder smartphone seasonality than in recent years. On the inventory front, our fabulous customers' overall inventory was digested throughout the fourth quarter. We now expect it to approach the historical season exiting 2020 better than our forecast three months ago. We will 
observed that the supply chain are changing their approach to inventory management amidst the lingering macro uncertainties. Looking ahead, we expect the supply chain and our customers to prepare a higher level of inventory compared to the historical season level for a longer period of time, given the industries that continue the need to ensure supply security. Next, let me talk about the automotive supply tightness. The automotive market has been soft since 2018. Entering 2020, COVID-19 further impacted the automotive market. The automotive supply chain was affected throughout the year, and our customers continue to decrease their demand in the third quarter. We only began to see sudden recovery in the fourth quarter. However, the automotive supply chain is long and complex, while many of our technology nodes has been tied throughout 2020 due to strong demand from our other customers. Therefore, in the near term, as demand from the automotive supply chain is rebounding, the shortage in automotive supply has become more obvious. In TSMC, this is our top priority, and we are working closely with our automotive customer to resolve the capacity support issue. Now I will talk about our 2021 outlook. For the full year of 2021, we forecast the overall semiconductor market excluding memory to grow about 8%, while foundry industry growth is forecast to be about 10%. For TSMC, we are confident we can outperform the foundry revenue growth and grow by mid-teens percentage in 2021 in U.S. dollar term. Our 2021 business will be supported by strong demand for our industry-leading advanced and specialty technologies, where we see strong interest from all four growth platforms, which are smartphone, HPC, automotive, and IoT. Next, let me talk about TSMC's long-term growth outlook. We are entering a period of higher growth as a multi-year mega trend of 5G and HPC-related applications are expected to fuel strong demand for our advanced technologies in the next several years. We expect global smartphone units to grow 10% year-over-year year in 2021. We forecast the penetration rate for 5G smartphone of the total smartphone market to rise from 18% in 2020 to more than 35% in 2021. We expect the silicon content of a 5G smartphone to continue to increase as compared to a 4G smartphone. We continue to expect faster penetration of 5G smartphone as compared to 4G over the next several years as 5G smartphones benefit from the significant performance, bandwidth, and latency improvement of 5G networks to drive more AI applications and more cloud services. We believe 5G is a multi-year mega trend that will enable a world where digital computation is increasingly ubiquitous, which will fuel the growth of all four of our growth platforms in the next several years. As we enter the 5G era, a smarter and more intelligent world will require massive increases in computation power and greater need for energy efficient computing and therefore require leading edge technologies. Thus, HPC is an increasingly important driver of TSMC's long-term growth and the largest contributor in terms of our incremental revenue growth. With our technology leadership, we are well positioned to capture the growth from the favorable industry mega trend. We now expect our long-term revenue growth to be 
10 to 15 percent CAGR from 2020 to 2025 in U.S. dollar terms. Now I will talk about a Yen 3 status. Yen 3 will be another full node stride from our Yen 5 with up to 70 percent logic density gain, up to 15 percent performance gain, and up to 30 percent power reduction as compared with 5 nanometer. Uh, N3 technology will use FinFET transistor structure to deliver the best technology maturity, performance, and cost for our customers. Uh, N3 technology development is on track with good progress. We are seeing a much higher level of customer engagement for both HPC and smartphone application at N3 as compared with N5 and N7 at the similar stage. Risk production is scheduled in 2021, and volume production is targeted in second half of 2022. Our three nanometer technology will be the most advanced foundry technology in both PPA and transistor technology when it is introduced. Thus, we are confident our three nanometer will be another large and long lasting node for TSMC. Finally, I will talk about TSMC 3D fabric. TSMC has developed an industry leading and comprehensive wave level 3D IC technology roadmap to enhance system level performance. Our differentiated chiplet and heterogeneous integration technology drive better power efficiency and smaller form factor benefit for our customer while shortening their time to market. These technology including chip staking solution such as SOIC as well as advanced packaging solutions such as Info and Cowars. We observe chiplets are becoming an industry trend. We are working with several customers on 3D fabric to enable chiplet architecture. SOIC small volume production is targeted in 2022. SOIC is expected to be first adopted by HPC applications where bandwidth performance, power efficiency, and form factor are aggressively pursued. We expect revenue from our backend services, which include both advanced packaging and testing to grow at a rate higher than corporate average in the next few years. This concludes our key message. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, CC. This concludes our prepared statements. Before we start the Q&A session, I would like to remind everybody to please limit your questions to two at a time to allow all the participants an opportunity to ask their questions. Should you raise to, wish to raise your question in Chinese, I will translate into English before our management answers your question. For those of you on the call, if you would like to ask a question, please press the zero, then one on your telephone keypad now. Questions will be taken in the order in which they are received. If at any time you would like to remove yourself from the questioning queue, please press zero two. Now let's begin the Q&A session. Operator, please proceed with the first caller on the line. Yes, the first one to ask question, Goku Harihalan from JP Morgan. Um, thank you uh, for taking my question. Happy New Year and uh, fantastic results and guidance. Um, so let me um, ask a question first on three nanometer. Um, uh, Dr. Bay, um, how should we think about the size of three nanometer? Uh, what we have seen is over the past two years, 28 nanometer was a very big node. 7 nanometer came out to be roughly 70% bigger uh, if you think about peak revenue uh, compared to 28 nanometer when you had new applications coming in. Um, how, given the big capex plan that you're also outlining, uh, should we think that 3 nanometer, once it ramps up fully, uh, would be substantially uh, bigger than um, 7 nanometer uh, in terms of peak revenues? Uh, just wondering uh, how we should kind of think about uh, the size of this surface load. Uh, and could you also talk a little bit about um, 
the opportunities within HPC. Uh, right now, you are already uh, engaged with multiple uh, HPC customers. Um, but uh, could you talk a little bit about um, CPU, uh, creative CPU, obviously, which is something on everybody's mind. Uh, could you talk a little bit about how TSMC would be uh, exposed to this market as well as we go into the 3 millimeter era? Okay, go cool. Sorry, this is Jeff. Let me please summarize your uh, questions, two questions. We'll uh, take them in the uh, one by one. Uh, Gokul's first question is with regards to three nanometer uh, and about the size of our three nanometer. Uh, he notes that in the past we have had very big nodes such as 28 nanometer and then seven nanometer. So Gokul wants to know in terms of the peak revenue contribution, do we expect or should N3 be substantially bigger than N7? That's his first question, correct? Yes, especially considering the step up in CapEx as well. Thank you. Well, Goku, let me answer your question uh, by saying that we do expect the three nanometer will be widely used in HPC related applications, in addition to the smartphones. So, uh, with this kind of uh, engagement with our customer, we do expect our revenue will be bigger, certainly. That's no doubt about it. So what is the next question? And then, Goku, I think the second part of your question is looking at uh, what are our opportunities in high-performance computing. Uh, Goku notes that we have multiple customers uh, engaged, but in particular, he w is asking about the progress or the status of CPU uh, opportunity uh, and what do we see uh, as the, you know, the, the drivers of HPC. Goku, we don't specifically name one of our HPC applications such as a CPU uh, to say that uh, what is the growth rate. But let me tell you that CPU networking and AI accelerator will be the main course area in the HPC applications. Did that answer your question? Um, <laughs> could you be a little bit more um, specific on x86? I mean, you already had good success in 7 nanometer penetrating the x86 market. Should we, say, should we think that the x86 market share continues to move up a lot uh, as we get into 3 nanometer? Okay, so Gokul, I guess the, the, your question is really on the x86 and looking at, you know, 7 nanometer has done well. As we get into 3 nanometer, will our exposure uh, to x86 continue to increase? Again, we don't uh, specifically come in on a very specific area. Uh, we work with our customer continuously and to uh, supply the very good technology to support your business. Okay. Thank you. I'll go back into the queue. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Goku. Operator, can we move on to the next uh, uh, person on the line, please? Next one to ask question, Randy Abrams, what is waste? Okay. Yes. Um, thank you. I have um, I did two questions to ask. Um, first, on the you talked about the automotive and I assume also your mature nodes are very tight. Um, you traditionally haven't added that much capacity on mature nodes and 8-inch. Um, could you discuss within that, because you, you have some mix of that, how you're seeing a, a strategy to add capacity for those nodes? And could you also look at auto has been only about 3% of revenue. Um, should we expect a meaningful uh, pickup in this uh, vertical, both the mature applications and also from new areas like EV and 8S? Uh, Randy, let me summarize your question. Uh, you're asking first uh, on the automotive side. Uh, he notes our comments that automotive supply is tight. Uh, do we expect a pickup in the automotive vertical? Uh, and then also in looking at the mature nodes, um, will auto benefit our mature nodes? And then ADAS and other trends in automotive, how do we see? Well, let me say that. Uh now we see the automotive industry need a lot of uh, semiconductor component, and uh, 
that including the leading edge technology for the ADA system and also some of the uh, mature technology for a lot of applications like a sensor, like a power management IC. We do see right now uh, it's a little bit shortage on the automotive, the mature technology supply, and we are working with customer to uh, mitigate uh, the shortage impact. And then Randy is also asking second part uh, on our mature nodes, given the tightness, will we consider to uh, add capacity for the mature nodes? We always work with our customer uh, to plan our t technologies, capacity, all those kind of things. For mature node, we used to convert some of the large capacity into uh, specialties. Uh, right now, uh, the trend stays the same. Okay, great. And my second question, it's off, sorry, two parts. Um, just want to ask on gross margin and inventory. Um, the gross margins, you've improved four points year over year. Uh, part of that utilization, uh, but depreciation also was up 45%. NT dollar moved against you six points. Um, so could you discuss if you've had a breakthrough on the cost reduction side and if now, I think last quarter you said about 50%, uh, but given what you've seen on cost reduction and coming off 54, if you could um, have better confidence on margin, um, could continue to do better. And then I'm, I just want to ask a quick on inventory. With it up 15 days, historically you draw down whip in the fourth quarter uh, but maybe the, the trend white inventory was rising into early in the year. Okay, Randy, uh, let me summarize your questions. Two parts. Uh, first is on the gross margin. He notes that uh, our gross margin uh, improved uh, throughout the year. Um, and Randy wants to know if there is a breakthrough on the cost side and therefore the long-term outlook for our gross margin, uh, is it still 50% uh, or not? Uh, right. Uh, Randy, this is Wendell. Uh, you just mentioned that our depreciation increased 45% year over year. I think the, the number should be 15% year over year. Okay. I was looking Q4, Q4 to Q4. I think the, the, just the fourth quarter over fourth quarter. Right, right. Now, in terms of gross margin in the long term, uh, we believe 50% gross margin uh, is reasonable and achievable. Uh, there are six factors affecting our profitabilities. The ramp of leading edge technology, price, uh, cost, mix, uh, utilization, and foreign exchange rate. Take foreign exchange rate, for example. In 2020, the average dollar against NT rate was 29.43. It is now trading between 27.90 to 28. That is already a 5% uh, appreciation of NT. Uh, so every 1% uh, of uh, appreciation of NT will affect our gross margin by 50 or 40 basis points. The other thing is the, uh, in the fourth quarter of last year, uh, as we mentioned, the utilization rate was uh, very high, extremely high. Uh, and that's the abnormal level of uh, high utilization rate cannot sustain. Therefore, in this quarter, we believe the utilization rate will come down a little bit, albeit it is still at a very high level. Now, every point of utilization rate change uh, will impact the gross margin by 40 basis points. A third example will be the ramp in our leading edge technologies. Uh, we mentioned last time that uh, we expect uh, M5 ramp in 2021 to affect our margins by two to three per percentage points and we still uh, think that will be the case. So uh, if you take all of those into considerations, uh, we believe 50% gross margin is reasonable and achievable in, in the long term. And then Randy had also asked about our days of inventory right. uh, increasing in fourth quarter. Right, and that's partially because some, as we have a very high uh, utilization in fourth quarter, but some of the wafers uh, will be shipped in the first quarter as opposed to uh, ship in the fourth quarter. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Randy. Um, operator, can we move on to the next caller, please? Next one, we have Sebastian Ho from CLSA. 
Hi, thanks, gentlemen, for taking my questions. Happy New Year. Uh, first question is I want to follow on the gross margin side. So if I look back in the past two quarters, past two quarters, the your gross margin um, actual results turned out to be uh, either at the high end or the surprise to the upside to your uh, original guidance, while revenue uh, is much on the high end of the guidance, while the Taiwan dollars continue to appreciate it second half of last year's. So which means that the margin uh, turns out to be better than what you originally guided for two quarters consecutively. So my question is whether or not um, the 1Q outlook the margin is too conservative again. And second uh, to, to that is the whether our structural probability will need to revise up just as our five-year uh, revenue growth hacker has just been revised up officially. Thank you. All right, Sebastian, uh, let me summarize your first question, your observation that in the past two quarters, our gross margin has come in at the high end or, or slightly above the high end of our guidance. Uh, revenue at the high end and the currency appreciation is there. So Sebastian's uh, question is first, you know, is the first quarter gross margin guidance too conservative? And what about the outlook for our longer term structural profitability? Uh, does it need to be revised up? Uh, okay, Sebastian, if we compare uh, four, fourth quarter to first quarter, 54% uh, in fourth quarter, and the midterm of our guidance for first quarter is 51.5%. The 2.5 percentage point difference actually mainly come from the uh, utilization as well as the unfavorable uh, foreign exchange rates. So at this moment, we're still sticking to this uh, guidance, although obviously uh, we will work hard to continue to improve the gross margins. Uh, as, uh, as for the long-term gross margin, uh, as I just reported earlier, that we are maintaining the 50% uh, gross margin to be reasonable, achievable, based on the, uh, the elements, the six factors uh, that I just talked about. Uh, we, the, each of those factors uh, will affect uh, our growth profitability in long term. Okay, Sebastian, do you have a second question? Yes, I do. Uh, thanks, Jeff, and thanks, Wendell. Um, my second question is on your CapEx outlook. Uh, apparently, that, uh, at least that's a significant upside surprise to me, and I think also to the consensus estimates. So the last time, I think the, the when company raised the CapEx from 10 to 12 billion level to the um, uh, like 15 to 17 billion level, then that resulted in the 30% revenue growth in 2020. And then, um, so my question is that uh, I think that CapEx reinvests for the future growth. So whether or not this uh, another step of the CapEx um, to like uh, to 25 to 30 billion this year will represent an, an reacceleration of the growth in 2022 or three. Thank you. Okay, so Sebastian's question is uh, looking at our CapEx guidance for this year, uh, 25 to 28 billion, uh, you, you know, it is above his expectation. So he's looking at the last time we have an increase in acceleration to CapEx from 10 to 12 to 15 to 17 uh, resulted in us growing 30% this year, 31% this year. So what is the outlook for our growth in 2022 or the future years? Uh, okay, Sebastian, uh, it's too early to talk about specifically about 2022. But as CC mentioned, in the next five years, our target uh, CAGR is between 10 to 15 percent. So that's already higher than the original uh, target of 5 to 10 percent CAGR that we used to have uh, before the last conference call. And that's also because of the higher uh, capital investment that we are ready to make to capture the uh, higher growth opportunities underpinned that by the multi-year uh, mega trends in the industry. Well, let me add something. This is CC way. This is a 10 to 15 that CAGR is based on a very high number of uh, 2020. So we still forecast a 10 to 15 that CAGR. Uh, that will tell you that how much of capacity we need to invest. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Sebastian. Thank you. 
Operator, can we move on to the next caller, please? Next one, we have Bruce Liu from Goldman Sachs. Hi, uh, thank you for taking my question. Great, great result and great guidance. I think the big difference is this time is that you raised the uh, uh, long-term revenue takers from 5 to 10 percent to 10 to 15 percent. Can you tell us that, you know, what in terms of this kind of incremental changes, how much the growth is coming from HTC and, you know, what are the other drivers for that? And in terms of, like, smartphone growth, I mean, the 5G penetration is already, like, 30-something percent in 2021. Moving forward, how much growth for, for you is coming from the dollar content growth or the human growth? Or, you know, can you, can you provide more colors on the growth? Okay, Bruce. So your question is really about our long-term growth outlook with uh, our growth target CAGR of 10 to 15 percent. Your question basically is by the different platforms such as HPC, uh, what is the growth, you know, contribution, and in looking at smartphone, um, you know, how much is dollar content, how much is unit uh, contribution? Well, let me answer the question by uh, actually uh, the growth rate from the HPC application is higher than the corporate average. And the uh, smartphone is very close to the corporate and also automotive is higher than the corporate average, IoT close to that uh, corporate average. Uh, did that answer your question? Uh, yes, thank you. Thank you. Okay, my next question is, talk, is I want to ask about the structural profitability. I understand that, you know, you know, all these six factors for the profitability, but that's the based on the assumption that uh, structural profitability remains unchanged. So do we consider to move up the uh, structural profitability because of the uh, current uh, uh, supply, uh, uh, structural growth for the company or the uh, 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 structural tightness for the, uh, especially the legacy uh, 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 technology? No. Okay, Bruce, your second question is on the structural profitability given the uh, higher growth outlook. Um, and also the tightness in supply at, at you know, legacy nodes or legacy technologies, uh, should, would we consider to move up the structural profitability target? Yes. Okay. Uh, Bruce, uh, as I just mentioned, we are maintaining the uh, financial objective, i.e. the structural profitability goal of 50% gross margin. And of those six factors, every one of them can affect the profitability. Uh, for example, uh, I just use an example in foreign exchange rate, uh, utilization, uh, and also the ramp of leading edge nodes. And uh, for example, uh, the leading edge uh, technology is uh, the complexity is increases, uh, the CapEx per K uh, is more expensive than before. So we are working very hard uh, with the customer to sell our value, uh, the service value, uh, the technology value, and also the capacity value, and firm up the uh, wafer pricing. At the same time, we also work very closely with our suppliers to continue improve our cost, so that altogether we can maintain uh, and earn a proper return in the, uh, in the leading nodes uh, compared to those of the uh, previous few nodes. As a result, we are maintaining our structural profitability goal as 50% of gross margin. Okay. So, understand, yeah. let me clarify that uh, whatever you uh, gain in terms of your cost saving, you will still, you know, return it to your customer and maintain your 50% uh, 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 profitability target. Uh, it's, uh, it's, there are six factors. So, all, you add all of them together, uh, it's... Uh, understand. Yeah. Yeah. Understand. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Bruce. Operator, can we move on to the next uh, caller on the line, please? Thank you. Uh, next one to ask question, Charlie Chan, Morgan Stanley. You're on now. Uh, thanks for taking my question. Happy New Year. Uh, so first question is also about the CapEx. Uh, so in the past, uh, for you to spend uh, huge CapEx on, on leading edge is usually for the uh, uh, smartphone application, <clears throat> given that the, the, the key user uh, is Apple. So this time you almost double your, uh, you know, CapEx level. Does it mean that there's a significant 
upside of the Intel CPU outsourcing? Uh, this is the uh, first question. Thanks. Okay, Charlie. So your question is on our CapEx. Basically, uh, Charlie notes that in the past, our large CapEx on leading edge historically has been for smartphone uh, platform. This year, of course, our CapEx number is much higher. Uh, so therefore, he is wondering whether it's intended for a particular uh, customer on, on the CPU side. Well, Charlie, let me answer the question. Uh, in fact, um, we don't comment on specific customer or specific area. Our CapEx guidance is based on the current long-term demand profile underpinned by the industry's mega trend. Okay, Charlie? Uh, yeah, and if, Do you have a second question? Uh, yes, I do. So just uh, uh, some feedback to, to uh, uh, CC, I think, you know, we all understand the mega trend 5G and the HPC. Uh, so the last question was just to understand whether there is additional uh, kind of growth driver, for example, IDM outsourcing on top of the organic growth. But but uh, my, my next question, uh, I think it should be uh, more related to your uh, strategy because uh, I think your existing uh, customer, uh, Intel, uh, two days ago, they also commented about uh, don't rule out the possibility of a licensed foundry process. And actually, you know, you know, 20 years ago, back in 2000, I, I think you also licensed uh, the largest semi process to national semi. Uh, so I'm not sure if uh, uh, TSMC, after 20 years, uh, do you uh, still uh, kind of uh, consider this kind of option? You know, meaning license your uh, foundry process to your IDN customer? or even, uh, you know, consider some uh, option like a joint venture uh, for the FAB operation with your IDM customer. Thanks. Well, uh, again, we don't comment on the specific topics or specific customer, but let me tell you that mm -hmm. we are working with our customer continuously and uh, to expand the TSMC's business and to uh, support our customers' demand. Okay, okay, gotcha. So I will be back to a queue. Uh, I have uh, some follow-up, thanks. Thanks, Charlie. All right, operator, let's move on to the next uh, person on the line, please. Next to ask question, Brett Simpson from Arate Research. Yeah, thanks very much. Uh, question maybe first for, for Wendell. So on the, <clears throat> on the revenue guide, um, I guess you, you're starting the year with a far better than seasonal Q1. Um, but I just wondered, how do you see the year playing out? Um, you know, should we expect in the second half uh, typical seasonality uh, this year? Um, and then in terms of the CapEx uh, guide for this year, obviously there's a big step up. And, and spending uh, is, this year is normally a reflection of how you think about long future capacity growth beyond 2021. So can we assume from the big increase in CapEx this year that your implied revenue growth in 2022 would be would be higher than 2021. Thank you. Okay, so Brett ha has uh, uh, two questions. Uh, one on the revenue guidance of we guided for mid-teens for the full year uh, growth for 2021. Uh, so he wants to know how does it play out throughout the year? Uh, is there you know second half will we see the typical seasonality, first half second half split? That's his first question. Uh, yeah, uh, from what we can see now, second half is still higher than the first half. <laughs> and then the second part is also uh, uh, CapEx and growth, looking at the increase in our CapEx uh, investment in 2021, noting that we typically spend CapEx uh, in advance of the growth that will follow. Uh, Brett wants to know then should we expect uh, a big year or, or a large growth year in 2000, uh, 2022, sorry. Uh, Brad, it's, uh, as I said, it's a bit too early to discuss 2022 in details. Uh, but CC just mentioned over the next five years, we're looking at a higher range of CAGR. And also, uh, mm -hmm. the CAPEX spent this year uh, means future opportunity in growth, not just for the next year, but also the years after that. Uh, so we're looking at mm -hmm. multiple years of uh, growth opportunities. Okay. And, and, and maybe just um, 
Maybe just one for, for CC Way um, on N3. Um, you mentioned N3 would have the best PPA, um, and, and we're, see, we're seeing a lot of transistor innovation at Intel and Samsung in the next couple of years, um, but you're planning to stick with FinFET at three nanometer, and, and I'm just wondering how you see the, 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 um, uh, the transistor density at three nanometer. I think at, fi at N5, you've talked about about 175 million transistors per mil squared is the, is the potential of N5. How should we think about N3 in that regard and, and uh, relative to you know, some of the transistor innovation we're seeing at, at uh, Intel and Samsung? Are you happy with the FinFET uh, uh, roadmap? Thank you. Okay, Brett, so your second question is regards to our N3 uh, and our decision to continue to use FinFET transistor structure at three nanometer. Uh, you note that uh, at five nanometer, we can deliver about 175 million uh, transistors per millimeter squared. So you want to know how this uh, falls out at N3, or maybe in terms of you know our three nanometer in comparison to uh, Samsung or others, how does it compare? Well, uh, as I said in my statement, that uh, N3 still provide 70% of the logic density gain, in addition to all the performance gain and the power reductions. Whether that's uh, at five nanometer, you got a 175 uh, million transistor per millimeter square. That what depends on you know, what the number in N3. I think that what depends on customer's design. We continue to say that uh, we offer the FinFET because of uh, uh, the technology maturity, the performance, and the cost are the best combination. Uh, for TSMC to uh, serve our customer. Okay, thank you, Brett. Uh, Brett thank you. Thanks. Operator, can we move on to the next uh, caller, please? Next one, we have Roland Shi from Citigroup. Uh, hi, good afternoon. Uh, congrats for the very good result. Uh, my first question uh, is also for the CapEx spending, and there are two parts of my uh, question. Uh, so with this, uh, you know, uh, sharply increased uh, capex spending, are you considering to sign long-term contracts with customers, especially to those customers who are new to adopt your most leading edge technology to ensure a proper return of your investment? And second part of the question is, uh, uh, it seems that you have spent ahead uh, in capex in EUV, uh, because uh, you know, the lowest productivity uh, for EUV when you first ran uh, EUV. Uh, so uh, I would like to know how much CapEx downside you expect after you have improved EUV productivity to the optimized level. Thank you. Okay, Roland, uh, we'll take your questions one by one. Um, both of them relate to CapEx. Uh, first one is that with the higher level of CapEx uh, that we have in 2021, Roland wants to know that would we consider signing long-term contracts with customers, especially with customers that are new uh, to uh, TSMC, to ensure that we are making a proper return? Roland, uh, sign a yes. contract to guarantee the loading in the future is not a, our common practice. We always work with our customer and uh, continuous work with customer to serve their demand. And uh, we also uh, uh, put our capex or expanding our capacity according to our current long-term demand forecast. All right, and uh, did that okay. answer your question? Okay, yeah, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, I take it. Okay, Roland, and then your second question is also related to CapEx. Part, uh, Roland, uh, let me summarize. Um, I think you are saying that in our CapEx guidance, your assumption that the lower productivity of EUV is means leading to a higher CapEx level for TSMC. So your question is that if the productivity, as the productivity of EUV uh, improves, then we'll, you know, how much, you know, how much reduction in capex could we see? Is that your question? Am I summarizing that correctly? Yes, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Thanks. Well, uh, let me answer that. 
we continue to improve the EU visa productivity because we are working closely with suppliers. And uh, so far, we, the improvement is obvious, but still not up to our expectation yet. As for that, the CAPEX will be uh, decreased because of uh, improved productivity. This is in our CAPEX plan already. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So, so means uh, you know, for going forward, I mean, uh, even you have uh, you know, uh, higher uh, EV product, uh, productivity, the capex spending or capex, uh, you know, uh, capital intensity probably will be still high uh, next year or maybe in the near future. Okay, so Roland, uh, his question is that even with EUV productivity and factoring into our capex, that our capital intensity could remain high even into next year. Well, the CAPEX remained high or the CAPEX intensity remained high is because of uh, technology complexity. It's actually that uh, N5 is much more complicated than N7, N3 much more complicated than N5. So most of the, the CAPEX intensity coming from this technology advancement. Uh, of course, EUV is a part of it, but it's not the only one reason. Okay. Then. Okay. Okay. Then uh, my, Thank you, my second question. Uh, Ro Ronan, I yeah, think that's yeah. two questions uh, already. Sorry, because we still have uh, several people in the queue. I, I would uh, kindly ask you to get back into the queue uh, so we can okay, allow everyone you. a chance. Yeah. Thank you. All right, operator, let's move on to the next uh, caller on the line, please. Yeah, the next one we have, Sonny Lin from CBS. Hi, good afternoon, and uh, thank you for taking my question. Uh, my first question uh, is that I want to follow up on three nanometer. Uh, I, I think uh, just want to get a bit of color on uh, your current visibility uh, for the customer adoption uh, into second half of next year. How does it uh, compare with the historical ramp uh, of five nanometer and seven nanometer and also uh, the cost per transistor for three nanometer versus five? Thank you. Okay, Sunny, so your first question is on three nanometer. You want to know the visibility into customer adoption of three nanometer into second half 2022, and how does it compare to five nanometer or, or prior nodes? And also the cost per transistor at three nanometer, is it still declining? Let me answer that. Uh, the cost per transistor actually is uh, continue to decrease, but for your question about the uh, uh, engagement with uh, the customer. We see a lot of uh, uh, customer, especially from the HPC field, they are increased in engaged with uh, their activity with TSMC. Okay, Sunny, do you have a second question? Right, so uh, just a very quick follow-up uh, to my first question. Uh, wonder uh, if CC would be able to provide any color uh, regarding the ramp for three nanometer for, for second half of next year. Thank you very much. It's an early adoption from our customer. Uh, it's both in a smartphone and HPG related applications. That's all I can say. Got it, thank you. You're and then uh, my second question uh, is for your uh, 2021 growth margin. So with KPAX going up uh, significantly, uh, how should we think about your depreciation growth uh, for this year and also uh, the impact on growth margin? Thank you. Okay, so Sunny's second question is on the 2021 overall growth margin with a higher level of CapEx spending. She wants to know uh, what will be the year-on-year -year increase in depreciation and what's the impact to the overall 2021 gross margin? Sunny, the uh, depreciation in 2021 is expected to be uh, between mid to high 20s percent higher than 2020. And the impact of uh, uh, to gross margins, well, it's too early to talk about the remaining quarters of the 2021. Uh, but as a general uh, feeling, you look at the, uh, uh, the uh, capacity utilization that I just mentioned, for an exchange rate uh, unfavorable, and also the M5 uh, uh, ramp uh, uh, negative impact on our profitability. Uh, those are the factors uh, 
uh, that may affect our all year 2021 gross margins. But as I said, it's too early to talk about details on the remaining quarters. Okay. Got it. Thank you very much. Uh, very helpful. Sure. Thank you, Sonny. All right, operator, let's move on to the next uh, caller, please. Right now, we're having Lord Chang from KGI. Go ahead, please. Hi, uh, thank you for taking my question and congratulations for the good result and, uh, and outlook. I also have the question about the CapEx and the growth margin trend. I think given your strong, uh, strong position in the most advanced technology node and the extremely uh, high CapEx in recent years, I believe that must, must be uh, some strong conviction on the other outlook with your major clients. So um, can you... Uh, Share with us your view that uh, for the N3 first year contribution will be similar to N5 that will have uh, probably more than 10% revenue for the first year um, mass production. Can we expect that to happen? And um, also on the growth, uh, growth margin side, um, given there uh, might be some sweet factor of your uh, major IDM clients, uh, for outsourcing opportunity, how would you manage uh, the iteration rate, uh, which may impact your growth margin substantially? That's my first question. Thanks. Okay, Laura, I, I think that's uh, two questions, but your, your uh, first question is on the um, on the N3, uh, sort of noting our strong position in the advanced nodes and also the higher capex as an indication of the strong conviction on major clients. Laura wants to know what will the revenue contribution of three nanometer in its first year uh, be similar to, or how does it compare to five nanometer in the first year? Okay. Uh, Laura, uh, it's it's really too early to talk about that uh, at this moment. But uh, as CC said, we believe N3 when it's out, it's going to be another large and lasting note for TSMC. Okay, got it. Thanks. And, and then, also, oh, sorry, yeah, the, um, the, um, probably the swing factor of the iteration rate that may impact the growth margin substantially, on the, and particularly for advanced nodes, how should we look at the, the trend, how you measure that? Okay, so Laura's second question is looking at our gross margin and then also looking at uh, opportunities, for example, in a particular IDM, if there's swings in utilization, uh, how would we manage that and how would that impact the gross margin? Is that correct, Laura? Yes, thank you. Uh, we, we don't, Laura, we don't comment on specific customers or a business outlook. Uh, the, uh, what we can say is we continue to work with our customers closely and to ensure that uh, we provide this uh, proper uh, capacity to them and we also maintain a good utilization out of it. And there's uh, Wendell, yeah. Laura, let me add some colors. I think uh, uh, our business has been driven tradition uh, in the past few years by smartphones. And starting from this year on, the HPC also jump on the wagons. And therefore, we looking forward looking. We see the traditional seasonality is can be moderated with multiple big customer with multiple market segments. So that's our uh, confidence. The other confidence is our capex includes three nanometer, also five nanometer. Our five nanometer is also very strong, stronger than we expected uh, uh, three months ago. So those two combined to give us the confidence to increase our capex. Okay, Laura? That, that's very helpful. Yeah, thank you very much. That's very helpful. Great. Thank you, Laura. Operator, can we move on to the next uh, caller, please? Next one, we have Robert Sanders from Deutsche Bank. Yeah, hi. Um, I've just got one question, actually. Just could you please um, comment more on the, on the wafer shortage situation and how severe it is at present? At which node do you see the shortage most acute? Is it 65, 90 nanometer, 0.11, 0.13, whatever it is? And how far out are you essentially booked out at some of these nodes 
Um, and do you think there's way for upside to way for pricing at these nodes? Thank you. Okay, so Robert, your question is on uh, the uh, tightness or shortage in the wafer. He is asking, uh, is it at particular nodes such as 65 nanometer, 90 nanometer, 0.13, uh, how short it is and how long uh, it will last? So Robert? Uh, most of the shortage actually is in the mature node. It's not in the three, uh, not in the five or seven nano, nanometer per se. But uh, in the, all the mature node, especially in 0.1 day micron and 40 nanometer and 55 nanometer in those area. Okay. Can, can, I, can I just start with one, one follow up, which is just, just, you know, you haven't traditionally built capacity there, but they could become path dependencies for the industry if, if they are continuing to be short. So would you actually consider building greenfield? Uh, to help the industry, or you think that other founders will, will handle that? So, Robert, your follow-up question is then, given the, the shortage or tightness on some of these mature nodes, will we consider to expand, build new uh, capacity at these mature nodes to alleviate any potential bottleneck risk? Well, actually, we are working with customers closely and uh, moving some of their mature nodes to more advanced node, where we have uh, uh, better capacity to support them. Uh, in addition to that, we also uh, uh, try to uh, manage this uh, shortage uh, condition, try to mitigate the impact from this uh, shortage. Okay. Thank you. Uh, operator, let's move on to the next caller, please. Next one, we have Rich Chi from Daiwa Securities. <coughs> uh, yeah. Yeah, hi, uh, Happy New Year, guys. Uh, this is Rick. Uh, my first question is, um, uh, I guess you guys mentioned that now your customers are happy living with a higher inventory than the historical pattern because of the macro uncertainty such as COVID-19. So I wonder if your customer would still be happy living with a higher inventory than the normal historical pattern if the virus if, if COVID-19 is contained. So this is my first question. Okay, thank you, Rick. So your question is, uh, are you know the higher level of inventory that we're seeing uh, partly is attributable to COVID-19? What if COVID-19 is no longer, uh, you know, everyone has vaccine, then it's no longer an issue? Uh, will this continue? Well, yeah, that's correct. Yeah, first, let's say that we really hope that the vaccine will work. And, uh, but even it is working, it takes time. And then also our customers still, at this today, they still have a different approach for the inventory management, as we say it, because of uh, uh, the, the secure of the supply uh, is more important than uh, anything else in today's uh, situation. So we don't think it's un it's uh, really uh, to revert back to the historical level of the inventory. Okay, um, thank you, that's helpful. Uh, my second question is uh, also regarding your CapEx, yeah, because the number this year is really high. So about 80% of your high CapEx this year is going to be uh, spent for leading edge. So uh, I wonder how much of that portion is actually for preparation of the capacity bill for 2022 and beyond, not for this year. So can you, can you share uh, your idea with us? Okay, so Rick, your question is on our CapEx, 80%, uh, about 80% is for the advanced notes. He wants to know how much of this uh, spending for the advanced notes is in preparation for capacity for 2000, uh, sorry, 2022. Uh, Rick, uh, we invest uh, this year actually for future year primarily. Uh, so uh, it's not only be, uh, for 2022. It, it may also be for the years following that. Uh, so that's, I, I think that's, uh, that's something that I'd like to share with you. Okay. Okay, that's helpful. Thank you. Yeah, yeah thank, thank you so much. No problem. Thank you, Rick. Uh, okay, operator, let's move on to the next caller. Next one, we have Andrew Liu from Sampling Securities. Uh, good morning, uh, good afternoon. Uh, thank you for taking my question. 
Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. My first question is, uh, if your customer has its own design roof, knows with the different metal and poly pitch spec from TSMC's one, uh, can this customer use the in-house manufacturing and TSMC foundry based on the same design, or it needs to redesign the chip based on TSMC 5 nanometer, 3 nanometer design roof? Okay, uh, Andrew, let me try to summarize your question. Uh, your question is about uh, customers' uh, design rules. If the customer has uh, their own design rules, but with different metal and different poly pitch uh, from TSMCs, uh, could this customer use uh, uh, TSMC foundry or you know, use their in-house manufacturing, or do they need to uh, use TSMC's design rules, basically? Andrew, uh, we always work, work closely with our customer to support their design into TSMC's uh, process technologies. So we can manufacture inside TSMC. So customer doesn't need to change its own design. Okay, I cannot answer this question because of uh, is uh, uh, two parties uh, cooperation. And uh, as I said, we work closely with them to support their design. Okay. Understood. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. My second question is, uh, since our three nanometer, four nanometer nodes will be ramping out next year, uh, what about second half this year? Will we have uh, something like a five nanometer plus or revision five nanometer process node for second half this year? Thank you. Okay, so Andrew's second question is uh, looking at second half of this year, uh, noting that next year we'll have, for example, N3 and N4, then second half of this year, uh, do we have any new node or continuous improvement, enhancement? Andrew, we always continue to improve the technologies. Last year, we introduced a uh, 5 nanometer to, uh, to the market. This year, we continue to improve it, and next year, we are improve further. So we never stop. Okay. So something like a five nanometer plus. Uh, if that's what you are, you are naming. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, let's move on uh, to the next caller, please. Next one, we have Mati Husseini from SIG. Yes. Thanks for taking my question. First question has to do with the revenue mix uh, forecast for Q1 by uh, technology and platform. It would be great if you could provide some color and I have a follow up. Okay, so Medi wants to know for the first quarter revenue by technology and revenue by platform. Okay, Medi, in the first quarter, uh, uh, HPC Automotive and IoT will increase sequentially, uh, while smartphone will experience a milder seasonal decline compared to its recent seasonality. And we do not provide a, a breakdown uh, guidance of revenue by uh, technology. Uh, yeah. Okay, so do you have a second question? Yes, just a quick follow-up on CapEx. Does your uh, 25 to 28 billion CapEx guide include investment for infrastructure in U.S. So Madi's question is, does our CapEx guidance this year include any uh, investment for the U.S. Uh, FAB uh, infrastructure? Yes, it does. The U.S. FAB uh, starts construction this year. Okay. Can you elaborate on how much of the CapEx is for the U.S.? Not at this point. Okay, thank you, Medi. Right, thank you. Thanks. Uh, operator, let's move on to the next caller. Next one, Chris Asanka from Cohen & Company. Yeah, hi, thanks for taking my question. I also had two on CapEx. Number one, um, pretty nice step up in CapEx this year from last year. Is it fair to assume your investment in EUV is also up this year relative to last year? And then I had a follow-up. 
Okay, so Chris's first question is that with our increase in CapEx guidance that we guided for in 2021 versus 2020 being an increase, uh, does that also mean an increase in the CapEx we spend on EUV? Uh, no, we do not disclose that details. Got it. All right, and then as a follow-up, uh, CC, you mentioned that how capital intensity is going to be high all the way through three nanometers, uh, but you also said long-term capital intensity should be in the mid-30s. So I'm just trying to square that by what do you mean by long-term? Because it looks like uh, if three nanometers is still going to be high, for the next few years, capital intensity might be higher than mid-30s. So at what point should we expect it to get to mid-30s? Okay, so Chris's second question is in terms of capital intensity uh, with, you know, the, the capital intensity or capex per K at three nanometer being higher, and then we having a long-term uh, capital intensity, you know, returning to mid-30s. Uh, he wants to know when will we return to mid-30s uh, capital intensity level. Is that correct, Chris? Yes. Yeah. Thank you, uh, yeah, we mean long-term, meaning three to five years. Uh, I think uh, 2010 to 2014 can be an example. During that period of time, uh, the capital intensity uh, rose from 38 to 50 percent, uh, maintained at high 40s for a couple of years, and came down afterwards. Uh, something like that should be a reference. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Chris. Uh, operator, let's move on to the next caller, please. Next one, Soku Hari Hassan, JP Morgan. Okay, hi, uh, thanks for taking my follow-up question. Um, one question on CapEx and depreciation. Um, do we, uh, are we having to spend CapEx a little bit ahead of uh, uh, what we used to spend in past uh, uh, in the EUV era, uh, is that all? Is that a function of having to spend uh, maybe six to nine months ahead compared to, let's say, in the immersion era? That's one. And uh, how should we think about depreciation versus jump in capex? Uh, Vendor, could you give us a little bit of guidance in terms of how we should think about depreciation for this year and uh, going ahead as well, given the higher level of uh, uh, capex? Okay, Goko, let me summarize uh, your first question is in terms of the capex, uh, he wants to know that uh, are we, with uh, capex, are we having to spend capex earlier uh, now? And is this because of EUV, that we need to spend more capex earlier? Well, let me answer the question. The answer is yes, because of uh, there is a long lead time for the EUV tools. Uh, the, the, the tool is a very complicated and the supply chain for the UV uh, takes a long time to prepare for it. And as a result, TSMC also had to plan in advance. It's longer than the normal tools that we used to have. Okay, and then Goku's second question is looking at with the higher capex, the depreciation outlook. Uh, right, for this year, Goku, uh, we expect the depreciation uh, to increase by mid-20 to high-20% for 2021 over 2020. Okay, cool, cool. Okay, and yep. maybe we just add, yeah, so even with that, we are comfortable with the 50% structural gross margin. So even with the uh, higher uh, uh, growth in depreciation, Goku is asking, are we still comfortable with the 50% gross margin? Yeah, 50% gross margin as a long-term target. Uh, we think it's reasonable and achievable. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, operator, in the interest of time, I think we'll take the last two callers. So can we proceed with the next caller on the line? Okay. The next caller is Randy Abrams, Credit Suisse. Okay. Yeah, thank you. My first follow-up uh, on U.S. and China, your overseas sites. For the U.S. site, you uh, bought 1,100 acres. Do you have plans to build out a mega fab or potential to build out multi-phase of 20K wafers? And then for the China business post Huawei, uh, where it's down to single digits, um, how's your outlook for the China and also expansion of the China from 20K? Okay, so Randy, your first question is regards to uh, 
uh, capacity and fab expansion overseas. So Randy is asking in the U.S., uh, in Arizona, uh, we target 20K. Uh, do we, uh, will we continue to build it out into a mega fab uh, type of site? And he also wants to know in China, uh, and I guess you're referring to Nanjing, uh, do we have plans to further expand the capacity in Nanjing? Is that your question correct? Uh, Randy? Yeah, that's a qu yeah, that's a question. Just the outlook to rebound China just post high silk and where it's down to mid single digit contribution. Yeah, this is Mark. Uh, let me take your question. Yeah, we recently acquired a big piece of land in Phoenix, 1,100 acres. Uh, definitely, that was the long term plan to have a uh, mega scale production sites. But currently, uh, our plan is work on the phase one production and target in 2024 is 20,000 wafer uh, per month. And we'll, uh, going forward, we'll see uh, according to the market condition and the cost economics and uh, provided by the government support to uh, mend the cost differences to decide the next steps. On China, <coughs> yes, we do have plan to uh, continue expand in China. But of course, uh, the business uh, in China uh, of the leading edge uh, will, uh, uh, does have a, a, a reset, but uh, we do expect uh, the demand in China uh, will continue and uh, we will uh, gradually, accordingly, increase our capacity in Nanjing. Okay, great. And my second question, if, if you could give, I think you gave first quarter, but the full year uh, growth for each of the platforms and also for the back end where you're doubling CapEx, um, what's leading that investment between the Info, COAS, SOIC, uh, and growth outlook for back end? Okay, so Randy uh, is asking about uh, 2021 growth, uh, first growth outlook by platform, uh, and then growth outlook by the back end. Uh, and then, you know, between the back end, info co by segment. Okay, uh, Randy, uh, for 2021 by platform, uh, we think HPC and automotive growth will be higher than the corporate average growth. Uh, smartphone and IoT will be similar to the corporate average growth in U.S. dollar terms. Uh, in terms of our back end business, we expected to grow slightly higher uh, than the corporate uh, in 2021. Uh, we do, do not disclose details uh, within the uh, back-end business. Okay? Okay, thanks a lot. All right, thanks, okay, Randy. Thank you. Okay, operator, can we move on to, in the interest of time, the last uh, caller then? Okay, so next one we have Sebastian Ho from Ship Lefe. Yep, uh, thank you. I'm pretty lucky to be the last one in that again. Thank you. Uh, a two follow up. The first follow up is to follow on Mark uh, comments that yeah, I think the Mark River said that the the company has noticed five nanometer demand also stronger than uh, you thought three months ago. So it's a curious about if you can give us more details about which applications are you seeing the stronger than expected demand. High performance computing. So for hybrid computing is the uh, is is the typical those uh, consumer electronics or is or typical HPC or uh, blockchain related. Sorry, I didn't hear the we didn't hear the last part, uh, Sebastian. You're, you're um, yeah, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm saying that the, the for the HPC part is it um, more related to your existing customers or more related to the um, uh, the blockchain related products. Oh, let me let me let me uh, this add a little bit color on this. High performance computing, as uh, Wendell just said, will <coughs> be the major uh, growth driver of our business. And this field is uh, currently under uh, exciting changes. Um, uh, the high performance computing's architectures, uh, as you know, for, from different customers, everybody is try striving to get the best performance with different architectures. So many, many, many more players getting into this, into this field. So we see a stronger innovation is coming uh, our way uh, on, on N3 as well as on N5. Yeah. Okay, 
Okay, that's great. Thank you. Cryptocurrency uh, is not on cryptocurrency, Sebastian. We don't we don't count on that, but we support that. Okay, yeah, that's fair. Uh, the second follow up is um, follow up to uh, to Wendell's uh, comments on that. I think that this year's based on the guidance that we will see the um, uh, capex intensity to go up to fifty percent. Um, so if we calculate, based on the revenue guidance, if we do some calculations, which means the, the free cash flow for this year could be, uh, the growth will likely to be, um, uh, will be pretty small or even flat. Um, depends on how things go, but uh, definitely not as strong as the past few years. So the, the, the question is, is the company still um, sticking to the, um, the, the dividend policy that is 70% of free cash flow? Okay, so Sebastian, your question is then uh, in looking at the CapEx, looking at our revenue guidance, the capital intensity this year being about, you know, around 50%, then the free cash flow growth may slow this year. So what is the outlook for the dividend? Uh, do we still uh, use 70% of free cash flow as the cash dividend uh, formula? Right. Sebastian, our uh, dividend policy has two parts, 70% of free cash flow, but not to be lower than the previous periods. So we remain committed to a sustainable and steadily increasing cash dividend. During the periods of higher investments, the focus will be more on sustainable. And as we harvest the growth, the focus will be on steadily increasing. Okay. So thanks, Wendell. So given that you're paying the, uh, the investors getting the dividend uh, in this quarter, and which is the, the earnings you made like three quarters earlier. So if we do the calculation simulation, which means that in the next 24 months, um, the investor will probably still get in the 2.5 NT dollars per quarter. Is that a fair calculation assumption? Uh, it, at least. At least. Okay. Okay. All right. Thanks, yeah, Sebastian. Okay, thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you, everyone. This concludes our Q&A session. Before we conclude today's conference, please be advised that the replay of the conference will be accessible within four hours from now. The transcript will become available 24 hours from now, both of which will be available through TSMC's website at www.tsmc.com. So thank you for joining us today. We hope everyone continues to stay healthy and safe, and we hope you join us again next quarter. Goodbye, and have a great day.